thank you, Chairman. And uh, I really like to uh, thank all the committee members to uh, give me opportunity to be back here. Uh, I think in last time I came here, uh, the last talk I did at the SPIE was uh, 1991. So that long I haven't been here. So I'm uh, really delighted to be uh, giving, giving, you know, being given opportunity to give a talk in front of a significant audience like you. Uh, you really mean it sincerely. And uh, the talk I'm going to, you know, the subject I'm going to talk about, I think you know, many of you know about my talk, you know, technology much better than I do. So uh, I like to uh, add a little bit of flavor, you know, being a president of JSR Corporation. And I joined uh, Japan Society of Corporate, corporate Executives. You know, this is an advocacy group to uh, address public and political policies, you know, to make a Japanese economy, Japanese society better in a global and also domestic context. So I spent about two years to really study uh, digital evolution. So uh, today, you know, two things I'd like to say. The first one is that, you know, since, you know, being a resist guy, I'm supposed to talk about the resist. So, uh, car is going to get you down to 10 nanometer half pitch. That's the first thing I like to say. And the second thing is that, you know, really, you know, there's a, you know, compelling reason why Moore's law have to continue, you know, will continue. So those are the two things I like to say. And I think I'm going to talk like 40 minutes, not really leaving any time for questions and answers. So uh, there's much talk about the AI last year, right? And uh, when I was a research engineer at the JSR Jess, Tokyo Research Lab, you know, working on Desire, you know, it's a diffusion enhanced selecting resist, you know, one of the top surfacing Im you know, imaging technologies. That time that the people were really talking a lot about the AI. But just like a Desire, you know, AI disappeared, you know, Soon the people kind of forgot about the excitement well, of, excitement of, excitement of AI. But last year, as you know, March last year, AI, you know, was the AlphaGo developed by Google DeepMind, beaten a Korean Go champion. You know, Go is a game of complexity. It also needs a lot of human intuitions. And uh, this is a very complicated game. Uh, you know, 38 million people play you know, globally. You know, most of them, they're in Asia. I don't play Go because I don't, I don't want to lose. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I know this is a complicated game. And a uh, lot of AI experts thought it's going to take more than 10 years before artificial intelligence is going to beat you know, human champions. But it happened last year. So this time, AI is not only a trend. You know, this is a real thing. And why, you know, how this happened? You know, we studied, and I had a chance to talk to, you know, quite a few AI experts. And also, you know, uh, people who are deeply involved in the digital revolutions last year or two, last two years. So. <clears throat> First of all, you know, by Nature magazine, uh, Google, you know, uh, DeepMind, they used two years of reinforcement learning. You know, reinforcement learning is a technique to train AI. Let one AI play against the other AI, you know, getting smarter and smarter, right? So it took them two years to train that, that AI. And the other part is that, you know, computation power. The computation power they used is supposed to be at least, you know, 1202 CPU servers and 172 GPUs. It's a huge amount of money. And also, one thing we got, you know, we have to remember is that it used lots of electricity, right? So, uh, you know, according to, again, you know, Nature Magazine, it should have cost them 26 million US dollars at least, excluding basic R&D costs. 
So no many company can afford spending that such amount of money for single purpose AI. At least I can't, right? Only a few, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, maybe those are the guys who can really spend such a lot of money. So really, um, one of the reasons why we say, you know, this time is different. You know, this is not a trend, this is a real thing, is that computation power, if you spend much money, you can do it. But also, knowing Moore's law, you know, transistor cost is gonna cut down in half every 18, 24 months. So maybe within eight, 10 years, it's gonna cost us maybe less than $1 million. That's what it means. And the other part of the AI is that ease of collecting lots of data through the internet. You know, according to Cisco, so data traffic is gonna grow 22, 23% every year. So, uh, you know, from 15 to 2020. So it means by 2020, the amount of the data traffic in 2020 is gonna be almost like a 7x of the one in 2015. It's a huge growth. So uh, to give you a sense of how big the data is, you know, again, according to, you know, Cisco, it's gonna take one for one single individual to you know, five million years to watch in a form, in a, if uh, it's in a format of video data. Sounds like a good, huge number, right? But I think you know, Cisco did a very good job to give you the impression this is a huge. You know, if I take this number, divided by number of the people on the planet by 2020, maybe eight billion people, you know, it's gonna be only 2.3 hours, by the way. But it's a huge number of data, you know, flying around, you know, 2020. It could be even, you know, bigger. So it's a good news for us. Lots of memories, right? Three percent data should be stored into the memories. So uh, AI really make several, you know, interesting, you know, applications possible. You know, autom autonomous driving, blockchain. Precision medicine, genomic sciences. You know, we are now uh, building a new R&D facility between JSR and the Keio University Medical Center and the hospitals. You know, we are, you know, lately we are working a lot with the doctors. And doctor says, future medicine really depends upon genomic sciences and uh, you know, on chip maybe, you know, advanced DNA sequencers, and all AI. So really the medical, you know, uh, me, you know medical science is gonna really depend upon a lot of, uh, you know, electronics. So there's a reason for Moore's law to continue. And it, it will continue. So this is a chart presented by Luke of IMIC. At uh, last year, uh, I, um, uh, IFT, IMIC, uh, ITF, I, I, uh, IMIC Technology Forum last year in, uh, in Tokyo. So Moore's Law is gonna continue with the help of a system and uh, design technologies. And also still scaling, although it's gonna be slowing down, but it's gonna continue. So again, our lithography community is going to, remains to be a centerpiece of this, uh, you know, technology evolution. So now, I got to talk about the lithography. So how far can we go? So this is a king of lithography. You know, really, our future, you know, lithography really depends upon the success of EUV lithography. Talking about the EUV lithographies, always, you know, people are talking about the three traveling monsters. You know, pericle, laser, resist. I don't know who has, you know, who causes the most trouble. But, uh, you know, being a resist guy, I'm gonna be talking about the resist. So there are five red flag issues with the EUV photoresist. Sudden photo speed, line collapse, 
and the other three. So I'm going to cover each, you know, each point one by one. Photo speed. <clears throat> so first one is in demonstration. This is a conventional chemical amplified resist over conventional uh, cyarc and uh, bottom layer. So this is the 18 nanometer eco line spaces over, uh, you know, over the uh, under layers. So it showed 28.5 millijoule photo speed. This is not bad, right? I hope. <laughs> but the same resist on top of the very special, you know, specially designed under layers in a sire under lay in a under you know under layers, which sensitizes the chemical reaction of the photo, you know uh, chemical amplified resist. So then we get nine millijoule without losing resolution. Still our results, but again there's a way to accelerate you know, chemical amplified reaction, you know, chemistry in a chemical amplified resist, you know, resist. It's just like, like this. PS car is another option. Line collapse. Resist, you know, sometimes get line collapse in the right-hand side picture. Some ugly, you know, line collapse picture. But, you know, instead of using DI water rinse, we are proposing a uh, solution that contains very special polymer, yellow polymer. So once you spin on, then uh, you can remove the residues in between lines and leave in a yellow polymer in between the uh, resist lines. Then you can etch it without damaging uh, photoresist layers, like uh, you know, uh, lower uh, side corner on the, on the right. So this one way to avoid the uh, line collapse of the resist. And the other collapsion happens in an uh, underlayer. So our engineers, they did a very good job to develop a new uh, underlayer stacks. You know, blue portion, this is a wet strippable SOG, and uh, it's over underlayer, you know, carbon-rich underlayer. So once the edge transfer is done, you can remove the blue portion with a conventional SC1 strip and leaving a yellow under layer, you know, just like on the right hand side, intact. You know, again, you know, um, this is the wet process, so there is almost little damage on the uh, on the uh, substrate underneath the uh, uh, underneath the under layer. So again, defectivity data it shows great, you know, before and after cyac strip. So now. I'm talking more on the practical side, integration. So this is a special CyArc, you know, we are also developing right now. This CyArc contains a little bit unique atoms. So it has higher edge selectivity than the conventional CyArc. On the right-hand side, the green shows uh, right-hand side, you know, conventional SOG, left side is a new CyArc. So, because uh, since it has higher selectivity to you know, under layer, so we can use thinner you know, top layer, which gives you better process window. And this is the uh, very unique under layer formulation in the middle. Uh, it you know, planalyzes 90 nanometer topography quite well. And it is a carbon rich macromolecule is, you know, as opposed to polymer or oligomer. So because of the nature of, you know, uh, na because of the nature of the macromolecule, it planalizes the topography quite well, you know, to the level of uh, one nanometers. So there is no need for CMP. Another way of doing lithography is to use a self-assembly. You know, here's the patterns, you know, of oxide and metal. And if you can really deposit, you know, we can deposit, you know, very specially designed oligomer that really goes preferentially over to metal A. And uh, again, with the self-assembly nature, it aligns well. Then after that, you know, you can deposit metal B and, uh, you know, blue portion can be removed. Then, you know, you can now, you can have 
middle A, middle B alternative patterns like this. So there is no need for alignment either. So this is a bottom up lithography, that's what we call. Now process window. This is a, you know, something I like, you know, this is a 14 nanometer half pitch patterns, you know, using a ASML 0.33 in a scanner. So uh, it's a little bit slow side, a 62 millijoule, but the WR of 3.56 nanometers, we get reasonable, you know, photo speed and focus, you know, budget. So now that uh, EUV becomes more and more manufacturally viable. So I think the biggest question you have is that in how small you can reduce the AWR. So this is the toughest part. You know, I'm optimistic, you know, being a CEO, I gotta be op optimistic, otherwise, you know, I'm gonna kill my, you know, myself. So I, I tend to say, just a matter of time, give us our time. So this is a picture presented in uh, 2007, 10 years ago at the SPI. This is the early days ARF pictures. You know, it's not done by us. It was done, you know, done by uh, one of the comp competitors at that time. But it, it shows really, really good patterns that time. You know, we couldn't do it. You know, we, the best we could do, maybe close to five to six, AW, six nanometer of AWR. So, but 10 years later today, what we can do today is this. It's the same ARF resist, chemical amplified. I think it is not only us, but also the other competition can do. Now, LWR is like 1.6 nanometers, you know, using, you know, chemical amplified resist. So it's not wafer queen. It's something we can do day by day, wafer by wafer. So I think, you know, give us a little time, maybe within five or six years, that today's LWR of 3.6 may be getting closer to nanometer range. And also, the other way to uh, reduce LWR is to use good, you know, uh, pattern transfer. So this is the 18 nanometer eco line spaces. You know, then um, uh, post edge, post sire edge, and post U uh, underlayer edge. So as you can see from LWR, 3.62 to 3.11. So it's about 20% improvement of AWR if the HR, H is properly, you know, optimized. So uh, I kind of tend to say, you know, conventional car can get us to 10 nanometer half pitch. So this is the uh, works, you know, presented to SPRE. Uh, left hand side, it is a work done by Kozawa-san and Takawa-san. You know, it is a measurement of uh, thermal, uh, thermalization distance of uh, PHS, which is a uh, polyhydric styling. So thermalization, thermalization distance is something to do with the blur. So according to their measurement, you know, uh, thermalization, thermalization distance of the PHS is like 3.2 nanometers. So higher the electric density is, lower the uh, thermalization distances. So for example, a acrylic system has like six nanometers. On the right hand side, you know, this is a theoretical calculations of thermalization distance versus uh, light edge roughness. Solid line is a high contrast system. Dotted line is a lower contrast you know, system. So obviously, high contrast system, you know, give you better AWR. So if you can notice, you know, like nine, nine nanometer half pitch, the red line, you know, th at the 3.2 uh, nanometer thermalization distance, AWR is close to 1.21, 1.2 nanometers. The next one is that, you know, it's done by, you know, it's a work uh, presented to, uh, you know, again, SPRE by Chris Mack. And uh, to reduce LER, we like to use minimum diffusion length. So if we limit 
diffusion length. You know, next question is that whether we can maintain the reasonable, reasonable photo speed. So photo speed is a multiple of uh, diffusion length, and this blue portion is called reaction radius, according to them. You know, if there is a question, please go on and ask Chris's. So, um, really the thing is that, you know, for us to reduce uh, diffusion length, to reduce uh, LWR, so our chemi you know, chemistry, meaning that, that we really have to, you know, design in a way that the blue becomes uh, larger and larger. So in that sense, we can still reduce the uh, LWR, but still maintain the full speed. So according to those, you know, those results, a uh, car resist can reach 10 nanometer hard pitch if acid diffusion and other resist chemi chemistries are properly controlled. Maybe with the help of the uh, edge transfer. So our goal is to hit uh, two nanometer LWR at uh, 10 nanometer equals, equals uh, equal line spaces patterns. So, uh, <coughs> you know, the far back end is going to be a very, very critical technology to extend Moore's, Moore, uh, Moore's law. So I'd like to, you know, briefly explain that, uh, you know, introduce you that uh, two new technologies. You know, this in-mold soldering, you know, this may be a little bit, uh, you know, um, new, you know, to you. So as you can see from the left-hand side, you know, this is the patterns made using uh, our photo-definable, you know, dielectrics. So you can make via patterns. This is like a 10 nanometer, uh, 10 micron patterns. Then uh, using uh, on right-hand side, right-hand right -hand side, you know, using a specially designed head, you can really the push molten solder into each hole. So that, that's how you make uh, bumps. You know, this is a quick demonstration of how it works. So heads coming over to wafer. Wafer has many beer holes, you know, patterned with, uh, by using our photo-definable dielectrics. Then, uh, uh, you know, molten solder is pushed into each hole. You know, actually, this head goes all the way across a 300 millimeter wafer. And uh, we can really create, you know, minimum uh, now, it's like um, 10 micron, you know, pitch, you know, beers. You know, industry standard is like a 30, mi you know, 30 micron these days. But uh, in the future, it's, you know, we've got to go less than 10 micron, you know, beers. And this is uh, also low temperature process, by the way. So another way of using a photopolymer is that, you know, this is like a wafer bonding or wafer, wafer debonding. So here, uh, wafer being uh, bonded onto the glass substrate. Then uh, after wafer is, wafer is thinned, you know, maybe less than 10 microns, then, you know, using uh, laser radiation, you can radiate interface between uh, grass carrier and uh, wafer. Then uh, it, uh, you know, debond wafer from a uh, glass carrier. So those are kind of new technologies, you know, pretty much over the horizon. So at the end, you know, I'd like to talk about the laws of accelerated returns. You know, see here, here we are in Silicon Valley. We hear lots about, you know, you know many buzzwords, right? Uh, seniority, you know, law of accelerated returns, you know, I think, you know, most of you may have heard of this, but I'd like to introduce some idea to you. So this is a canonical milestones. If you look up in your internet, you see this one. And uh, this is really that uh, all the human invent, event uh, plotted over long, you know, long scale. So time to next event, time before present. You know, starting from Milky Way. I, sh I highlight a few. So Milky Way, Milky Way, like 10 billion years ago, 
It was created 10 billion years ago. First life appeared on the, on the planet like four billion years ago. First multicellular life you know, appeared, emerged on the, on, the, on the planet one billion years ago. 400, 400 million years ago, that is the year of Cambrian explosion. And 50 million years ago, asteroid collided onto uh, you know to the Earth. And chimpanzee and a human diverse five million years ago. Emergence of Homo sapiens, 500,000 years ago. And more than human, you know, like 100,000 100, years ago. You know, our ancestor find a way to, you know, create a fire. It was 11,000 years ago. And uh, we invented uh, zero in this one point, like uh, 14, Hundred years ago, 1.4 years, you know, 1.4 thousand years ago. So really, all the human events they fall nice straight line once you you know plot on a long scale. So that's the exactly the law of the accelerations. So Moore's law is the same way, right? So coming close to our modern age, industrial revolution. 1450, that is the year when uh, one German guy called Gutenberg, you know, he invented the printing machine, okay? Then 300 years later, what happened? It is about 1760s. That's when Watt invented the steam engines. Steam engines became locomotives, locomotives to railroad. So it changed a lot of life. And it also increased the productivity. So it's called first industrial you know, revolution. Then 150 years later, what happened? That is the uh, late 19th century. Uh, internal uh, combustible engine was invented. So that is the start of the second industrial revolution. It changed our life. It changed the, you know, increased the productivity. That's how that uh, when uh, we got a concept of the high volume manufacturing, uh, our chemical industry also flourished about 1900s. So I came here from 300, you know, 150. Now that uh, what's going to happen, you know, what happened eight years later, 1980s, PCs. You know, those are the Mac and uh, IBM. And uh, really, personal computers, you know, change our life. Up until then, computers for the people who know how to program computers. But from that time, you know, with the help of the graphic user interface and mouse, you know, everybody was able to, you know, use a computer. And the other, you know, invention is that internet. You got a mail, right? So 1980s, there are two you know, big things, PCs and internet, that changed our life. I don't know whether you can call this as a third industrial revolution or not. You know, depending upon the people, you may say this is a third, you know, this is not third. But it is true. It changed a lot. You know, this is a one inflection point. And we cannot think of any, you know, our life with a PC and the internet now. So now, 300 years, 150 years, 80 years. So what's going to happen in 40 years after uh, 20, uh, 1980? Next inflection point. So this is the time when the computer is going to change a lot. From programming com you know, a computer to cognitive systems. So what uh, they mean by cognitive is that it's a learning computer. You can teach or you, you know, a computer can learn themselves. So this cognitive computing uh, you know, era is going to be a next inflection point in my opinion. 
So cognitive computing, uh, your left-hand side brain may be accelerated or assisted by quantum computing. You know, IBM now that they published that uh, five qubit quantum computing on their website. Lots of, us, lots of people kind of started, started studying it. And the right hand side brain, right hand side, right hand, right side, I'm sorry, right side, right hand side of a brain, you know, right brain can be assisted by neuromorphic devices. Instead of depending upon a rigorous software, you can use parallel, you know, processing devices to assist your right brain. So uh, it's gonna accelerate, the, you know, accelerate, you know, cal you know, the you know, rate of the calculations, but also it reduces uh, electricity significantly, maybe more than 10,000 times. So with uh, our logic devices, current CMOS, you know, logic devices in the middle of it, you know, it would be both supported by quantum computing and neuromorphic devices. That's what. Uh, you know, maybe how that uh, quantum computing, you know, will work. So now that the 20 years later, I don't want to think about it, right? But uh, this is exactly the year of the singularity. So one AI is going to prevail over the total wisdom of the, you know, entire human beings. And I don't know how far it's going to go. I don't want to think about it, to be honest. I just want to leave it up to a uh, young audience here for the future. So cognitive computing, you know, just like a PC, kind of made a whole computer science kind of transparent to us. You know, cognitive computing would be make all AI, you know, transparent to our users, to the users. So uh, by the time, I think, you know, AI is gonna augment whatever you do. A lot of, you know, many things you do today. And uh, so therefore, this is going to be a huge inflection point. But as please do remember, logic has to continue, and memories will be more memories will be needed. So uh, for those people who say, oh, whether you know most law is going to continue or not, a lot of people say, yeah, well, you know, ask us, what would be the killer applications? Now it's, it's just obvious. It's a data-driven society and artificial intelligence. This is by far the biggest you know, driver for semiconductor industry you know, for the next 10 years. So um, <clears throat> Moore's law has to continue. But we got unprecedented challenges. EUV, heterogeneous interconnect, like Known for Neumann devices, there are a lot of many unprecedented challenges. How are we gonna do it? You know, we gotta try out of box ideas. One thing we're proposing is that you know this is EUV manufacturing joint venture between JSR and IMEC. This is a facility in Belgium, right next to IMEC, and that's where we can ac we can accept whole you know total manufacturings of any, from any photolytic suppliers. You can come and use it. So this is an open you know, forum for any photolytic suppliers who commit to EUV is lithography. So uh, you can use, uh, you can have an access to uh, IMEC tools, and also you can have an access to, to analytical tools that uh, JSR Micro has. So we can put, you know, place uh, you know, proper firewalls so that, uh, you know, this one now, uh, you know, out of box idea we are proposing. So strong commitment and unprecedented forms of a collaboration would drive Moore's law to two nanometer, you know, logic node. And I'm really hoping so. And uh, there are a lot of compelling reasons why Moore's law need to continue and law scaling need to continue. You know, really, you know, last year I came back in SPI and I met a lot of my, you know, all my friends, and I'm so happy. But one thing I'm worried about is that, you know, I see uh, fewer, you know, younger engineers and scientists. You know, something, uh, you know, we need to, uh, you know, pull them in to this community, right? 
And also, uh, there's no roadmap. You know, ITS gave up, uh, you know, the role of uh, making roadmap. And uh, there is one uh, heterogeneous interconnect, you know, roadmap continues. But really, the reason why Moore's law continued for many, many years is that with that law, you know, people really invest a lot of money on the people to make it happen. So really, critical mass was a very important element for the success of Moore's law. So therefore, maybe, you know, this may be my last time to uh, come to SPI and uh, give a talk. But really, what am I, you know, asking for is that if uh, SPIE, you know, this lithography community, you know, uh, take a role of, uh, you know, just develop a new roadmap for lithography. So thank you for your attention.